I am not sorry for something I didn't do and I am not sorry for the things I did do. This is Ronnie O'Neill III, the man that killed the mother of his children, his special needs daughter, and stabbed his son more than 20 times. It's a miracle he's still alive. How could this happen? Let's analyze the case. 29-year-old O'Neill III and 33-year-old Kenyatta Barron lived in Florida with their two children. Although they weren't dating anymore, Kenyatta still allowed him to stay in the house. Kenyatta's 9-year-old daughter Ronivia had severe autism and was non-verbal, but her 8-year-old brother Ronnie IV had a special way of communicating with his sister and despite their challenges, they all seemed to be getting along very well. The only problem is that O'Neill had anger issues, so they frequently argued to such a degree that the police had to be called there quite a few times. Then, on March 2018, at about 11 p.m., police received a 911 call from a frightened woman saying she had been shot. In the background of that call, O'Neill can be heard screaming Allahu Akbar, which means God is greatest in Islam. Not long afterwards, O'Neill calls 911, claiming that he was attacked by white demons that were inside his ex-girlfriend. He said, she tried to kill me. 911, what is your emergency? Hey, I've just been attacked by some white demons inside, with inside Kiki. Kiki, her name is Kiki, and she tried to kill me. And what you just, huh? When the police ambulance arrived, they realized the fire started inside the house. The investigators were emotionally affected by what they saw. There, they found remains of the small daughter Ronivia. Her mother was lying motionless on the lawn. A little boy came out. He was covered in burn marks and looked like he was severely injured. He was immediately taken to the hospital. According to the couple's son, Ronnie the Fourth, and other pieces of evidence, here's what happened during the incident. O'Neill and Kenyatta were arguing loudly, so he went to see what was going on. He saw his father holding a shotgun and his mother running in Ronivia's room to hide in the closet. Noticing that his son was there, O'Neill told him to walk around and say the words, Allahu Akbar. Then, he restrained his son to hold the shotgun with him while he fired it. Somehow, Kenyatta succeeded to call 911 and tried to run outside the residence, but Ronnie chased her and beat her with the shotgun. The prosecutors in the case, in separate testimony, indicated that Kenyatta was beaten so hard and so brutal with that shotgun that it had broken into pieces and the barrel had bent. Then O'Neill returned to the house with an axe in his hands and hit Ronivia in the back of her head. Ronnie Jr. testified that he saw her crying and that there was blood everywhere. As she was a disabled child, she stood little chance of defending herself. Ronnie Jr. said that after murdering Ronivia, his father caught him, stabbed him, and then tried to set him on fire. Then, O'Neill spread gasoline throughout the house, set it on fire, and then fled outside. Although Ronnie Jr. was gravely wounded, somehow he got outside the house where he was found by a neighbor. He was covered by burn marks and he had been stabbed so savagely that investigators thought he would not survive. As a result of Ronnie Jr. testimony and other pieces of evidence, next morning O'Neill was charged with two counts of first-degree murder, but he strongly resisted arrest, so the police had to tase him before they could bring him in. In 2021, the case went to trial, and O'Neill decided to represent himself. The judge told him it was not a good idea, but as he insisted, she went through the proper checks to be sure he was mentally fit to do it and then allowed him to be his own lawyer. In his opening argument, he was aggressive and he indicated that the evidence was fabricated. And the evidence is going to show we are under some of the most fish iron fabricating fictitious government you ever seen. When he was played with Kenyatta's 911 call, he was more preoccupied by his voice in the background than by what he did to her. <coughs> Listen to the background. Hello. 
What stood out in this trial was the cross-examination of his son. Although the questioning was done remotely, Ronnie's father forced him to relive the trauma and didn't show any empathy for him. Did you see me shoot your mom? No. Did I hurt you that night of this incident? Yes. I did. And how did I hurt you? He stabbed me. On his closing argument, Ronnie admitted Kenyatta's homicide. I did kill Kenyatta Van. But I want you to tell it like it is. Ronnie when understood Ronnie that there is a huge possibility to receive a death sentence, he finally asked for a qualified lawyer to represent him. Probably the most important decision you will ever make, as it should be when there's a human life at stake. The trial you just sat through dealt with the crimes for which Mr. O'Neill has been found guilty of. However, this portion of the proceedings will now focus on Mr. O'Neill his life, his character. The trial lasted three weeks. The jury only took two hours to convict Ronnie O'Neill III on all charges. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, which means he will spend the rest of his life behind bars. Judge Michelle Sisko that sentenced Ronnie said that this is the worst case she has ever seen in her entire career. I'm gonna look you in the eye and tell you this is the worst case ever, ever in my life. And I have seen some horrors, but this is it. When the person from the um, fire department, when he testified, and when he said that he retrieved the body of Ronevia O'Neill from the home, and all he could do was sob. He took every ounce I had not to start sobbing too, because there is no way any person with any feeling could have witnessed or seen the photos of what occurred that night and not be haunted for the rest of your life. I know I will be. For the rest of my life, I'll be haunted by what I saw as far as the evidence and just the abject cruelty of it all. The abject cruelty. When you analyze cases like this, you can't stop asking yourself, how can someone get into that state of mind to be able to kill almost all his family without remorse? Remorse is not just a statement of regret, of just saying I'm sorry. Remorse can be determined by looking at someone's reaction to difficult circumstances. Remorse is something that is felt and demonstrated. In O'Neill's case, his demeanor and all his behavior makes us think that he has no remorse at all. He seems very calm, relaxed. He even shows love notes to another woman in the courtroom. Even when he receives his sentence, he doesn't seem to be too much affected. The first question that we can address is, was he mentally ill? He said he was never diagnosed or treated for any mental illness. Now let's have a look in his early life. Maybe we can find some explanation there for his present behavior. O'Neill and his brother were sexually molested at the hands of relatives at the age of five. He never knew who his biological father was till adulthood, but he lived in a stable home. He held steady jobs and also created his own songs and performed in a hip-hop duo. He sang in a church choir and he had played football in high school. In his adulthood, he got into an Islam group which advocated against guns and inner city violence. As an adult, O'Neill developed grandiose beliefs. He thought he was invincible and ordained by God. He often compared himself to Malcolm X. In jail, he spoke of people trying to kill him, of jail staff trying to poison his food, and of seeing energy waves. A forensic psychologist testified that the childhood trauma led O'Neill to develop PTSD and he also had a delusional disorder. It seems that his biological father also had the same problem. All the challenges that Ronnie had in his past does not excuse what he did. So what could be the answer? Did he have an undiagnosed mental illness? Was he born evil? Or he just took a very bad decision in the context of childhood trauma? This story has a happy ending. Ronnie O'Neill III was adopted by Detective Blair that was assigned to investigate a case and his wife Danielle. No idea going into it that I was about to meet my future son. 
Danielle said that the first time he saw Ronnie, she knew she wanted to be his mom. I did know that I would love to be his mom. He's a joy to have around the house. Sometimes he misses his mother and sister. And, uh, she was just a good mom. My sister, she couldn't talk, but she still, like, she still, like, could uh, move her head and say, like, we used to do sign language. She was very nice. But he's healing in his new family, where he's loved and protected. He will not be defined by what his father did.